Hey, what's going on, everybody? Artie, and uh, welcome to Age of Quarantine on Wednesday, May 20th, my daughter's sixth birthday. I would like to wish my daughter, Charlotte Moon, a happy birthday. Um, uh, we're tonight, we're going to have a special episode, as usual. It's always special when I'm hosting, right? Uh, a special episode with a guy named Josh Newton who uh, is currently in a band called Shiner. He was a band called Shiner before this as well. Um, but back in the day, uh, he's also been in Glaze Baby, uh, Every Time I Die, From Autumn to Ashes, The Damn Things, um, like Season to Risk, who are fucking awesome. If you've never heard of Season to Risk, please go check it out. Uh, so I'm just waiting for Josh to join. Anyway. He's an old friend of mine. He actually played in uh, Primitive Weapons for a couple of shows uh, when Eric was off being a super duper rock star. Um, and the Josh Newton just joined, but unfortunately I need him to... Yeah, here we go. Josh Newton, this is going to happen. I'm so excited. Yeah! Howdy. How's it going, buddy? Good, how are you? All right, you know, just... Uh, was having a few uh, few audio problems, so you know. I wish you could be here to uh, to have roadied that. Yeah, <laughs> I would totally tech that. <laughs> you tech the shit out of that. Yep. <laughs> oh man, what have you been up to, man? Uh, I've been sitting in my apartment and uh, eating a lot of edibles and playing a lot of Call of Duty. Really? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that sounds great. You're in Los Angeles, right? I am. Yeah. Uh, what part of Los Angeles are you in? I moved downtown about eight months ago. Oh, DTLA. Nice. It's, it's wild. Yeah, how's the, uh, how's the homeless situation going on during this? It's, whole a, it's pretty intense. Yeah? Yeah. It kind of reminds me of the Lower East Side in like the 90, early 90s. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I was definitely around for that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I guess, uh, it, you know, is there a lot of like food lines and shit like that or like? Um, if you go further east towards like Skid Row, yeah, um, you see a lot of people, you know, hanging around. But um, it's, I mean, it's definitely bad. But it's, uh, you know, it's I, I, it doesn't feel as bad as like San Francisco to me. You know, right, right, right. Of course. Well, yeah, San Francisco has been horrible for forever. But yeah, the, um, Chris does this every time he does an interview. Would you be on tour right now? And if so, where would you be? I would be the first day of the Shiner tour would have been tomorrow. Oh. Um, it was going to be us and Sweet Cobra at uh, Lincoln Hall in Chicago. And yeah, so we would have been driving. That, well, we'd probably be in Kansas City practicing. But uh, shortly thereafter, we'd be driving to, uh, to Chicago. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that makes me sad. Um, yeah, it sucks. Uh, so... Just uh, I always have to do this because most of the people that I interview, I've either played with or been friends with for a very, very long time. Mm. Uh, you are both of those things. Um, uh, we met at Starland Ballroom, I believe. No, not Starland Ballroom. Uh, Spaceland. Sorry. Yes, we you did. Know, but Eric Temple yeah. opened for Shiner. And, yeah. um, of course, I was completely intrigued because you're left-handed. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm left-handed. You had that. You had that ASAT, I think, that GNO. Did yeah. That was that was like the only working guitar I owned at that time. Because mm. fucking, luckily I signed to a major label and bought like eight thousand guitars after that. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, um, and uh, what I remember about that show, besides Jason Gherkin uh, drinking so much beer before getting on stage and then playing like better than fucking Neil Peart, uh, <laughs> was how many fucking pedals you had. Oh my god. I was yeah. Like, Christ, you had like 30 pedals. There's it, more now, actually, but. <laughs> we should get into that later. I want to I want to talk about your your geeky techiness um, and your like, you know, you have a signature guitar. Right? Am I correct? With, it's yeah, it's I don't. OK, yeah. yeah. We'll you get want into, a signature guitar? Sure. Uh, so fast forward, you live used to live a couple of blocks away from St. Vitus. Yep. And uh, you played bass for my band and Chris's band and Dave's band, uh, uh, Print of Weapons. 
Yeah. Uh, although I think Aaron was playing drums at the time, if I remember yes, correctly. Yes, he was. Um, and uh, that was a super fun time because there were two lefties on stage. <laughs> doesn't happen very often. No, it doesn't. And it, what was great about that was we played Music Hall of Williamsburg, uh, opening for VOD, I believe. Oh, and, yes, yes. And I, I'm, I'm going to guarantee that that's the only fucking time that two left-handed players have been on that stage ever. So I would we, say that's pretty likely. Sort of a record. <laughs> Although, I think the Black Angels have two lefties, too. Fuck. Sorry. Fuck. I know. All right. Well, fair enough. We'll have to, we can find a third guy and do a <laughs> band. We can no. get Ryan, Ryan Pope from the Get Up Kids can play drums because he's left-handed, oh. too. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay, cool. I just toured with them last year. He is left-handed. Um, anyway, so let's get into your history. I know most recently you've been a tech. Um, yes. Uh, also playing with Shiner. Uh, but you've had a pretty storied and interesting career, both with your own stuff and then filling in for people and then doing your tech stuff and obviously uh, becoming friends with those people that you text for and starting bands with them. So let's go by, way back to Glaze Baby. Okay. What was, what was it that got you into, like, you're very associated with sort of like post-hardcore and noise rock uh, style. Um, maybe like post-hardcore, but with like a bit of a Radiohead feel to it yeah. uh, in a big way. Um, what, uh, you know, what was your early influences? How did Glaze Baby start? How did you get into music? Oh, uh, my sister played and... I wanted to play. I, it started initially when I saw Kiss on the Dinah Shore show, which is <laughs> dating myself a little bit. Okay, um, yeah. I think I was like five or something, and I saw Kiss on TV, and I was like, well, that's what I'm going to do. And it was, there was never any other direction that I cared to go in. I just wanted to be... I didn't even really care what kind of music at first when I was a kid. Um, I just wanted to be like... Because my, my heroes at the time were like Jaws and Darth Vader and... Jason Voorhees or something, you know. So that was, Kiss was kind of all that wrapped up into one for me, and Evil Knievel. And did so you, Kiss was like sort of all that. Did you have a left-handed guitar in the house? Or? I did not. I had, I flipped a Hagstrom 3 upside down. So you, you never even tried to play writing? Uh, no, no, never even attempted it. I, I hear that. I it left. was just never, it was never comfortable for me like to go the other way. Right. Yeah, so. there's, there's such a, a long, history of guys who are naturally left-handed who just learned how to play righty and it's it's interesting because uh, you i feel like if i was forced to play righty i would have just given up you know what i mean like because i wouldn't have yeah. been i wouldn't have progressed i wouldn't have gotten good enough but i know plenty of guys who are naturally lefty who play right-handed who play just fine you yeah. know but yeah, I, mean, I imagine that you're just really, really lefty the same way I am, where it's just like- It just, it just felt, so, it felt so alien that I was like, this is never gonna work. If, but you I, know, I mean like- You played upside down guitars. Did, did you play early on, would you ever get on stage with an upside down guitar? Cause that's, or did you have natural lefties? No, I did with, with Glaze Baby, since I used to smash a lot of guitars, I played a lot of just crappy right-handed guitars and would just smash them. And, I had a fur covered guitar and like polka dot guitars and just anything stupid. Um, yeah, it's interesting just because like I I played uh, I played upside down first and like it, it affects the way you learn how to play because you have yeah. to admit, like get away from the dials and it, like so you're like like this all the time. On yeah, kind of scrunched up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but what I would do is I would tend to play I would tend to strum up by the neck. Mm -hmm. so, like it totally changes your tone it's yep. like it's it's fucked all right enough about being a lefty um <laughs> although we're special we're special josh um, i mean if you think about it besides us everybody who else played left-handed was like revolutionary oh yeah, uh, yeah like yeah. Hen hendrix go through the Kurt line. cobain paul mccartney like all those dudes didn't just play lefty they like changed music which right. is pretty crazy yeah. i'm not saying we did that yeah. but <laughs> but uh, what's funny about the about all this like live streaming shit that's going on right now is that everybody's lefty so it, i don't yep. know if you know that 
It's hysterical. I've seen a couple, yeah. Shit, I can sell my guitars now? All right. Welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> Except we'd be shitty writing if we did it. Yeah, that'd be awful. Actually, I had to learn to play. Uh, I know an E chord right handed because the Kings of Leon sound guy hates the way I play it when I play it upside down. So he made me learn an E chord the other way so I could check the acoustic guitars. <laughs> Fuck that guy. And I hate acoustics, so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we met when you were playing in Shiner. Yep. And uh, Shiner just recently put out a new record, which is fucking awesome. Thank like, you. Like, it, I, I, I don't know, like, when, when, when that came out, I was just like, holy shit. Like, I always, I've always been jealous of Shiner because of, like, I remember when The Egg came out and I was just like, God, I want to play like that. I just want to play. I want to have the patience and the, you know, like, to, to be able to create that kind of space. And you guys are just so fucking good at it. And your lines are so fuck. your lead lines are so good. And, you know, like, your 8,000 effects pedals that, you know, sound fantastic. But like, how did Shiner start? How did you meet like Alan and Jason? And, oh, Jason wasn't in the band originally, right? Um, no, he, uh, Tim Dow was the original drummer who played with the Year of the Rabbit. And right, 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 right. A bunch of other stuff. Um, I, when I was in Glaze Baby, we signed to a label called Red Decibel and Season to Risk from Kansas City was on Red Decibel. So we started going through Kansas City a lot, you know, being friendly with those guys. And I fell in love with the city and how cheap and easy it was. It was much cheaper and easier than Boston was at the time. Um, or Providence, really. And uh, so I finished being in Glazed Baby. After, I already quit Glazed Baby once and played an Unsane for a minute. Um, and in 95, I moved to Kansas City. Coincidentally, while Season to Risk and Shiner and Glazed Baby were on tour, Shiner had asked Paul from Season to Risk, to play bass in Shiner. And I think I may have been the first person he told like, hey, what do you think of this? And I was like, I would go do that right now. So I took Paul's place in Season to Risk when I moved to Kansas City, um, played with them for a bunch of years. And initially my roommate, Joel Hamilton, played second guitar for Shiner, and um, who I was also in Blaze Baby with. And he ended up moving back to Brooklyn. And I just kind of slid into a spot there in Shiner. Um, Did you play on, uh, so I, re I remember, I recorded with a guy named Martin BC um, yeah. in 1994 with my old band, Mind Over Matter. And mm -hmm. Season of Rain had just been in the studio. Did you They were there record? for a while, I think. I didn't, that was Paul. But coincidentally, Sorry, Jason. Uh, uh, I didn't play. There we go. Go. Uh, I didn't play on that record. Paul Paul did, but Jason coincidentally played drums on that record, Jason Gherkin. So it's kind of pre proto oh, Shiner. Awesome. Killer. Yeah. So yeah, so Shiner, uh I mean, you guys were uh, every record you put out was on a different label. Yep. Which was pretty interesting. Well, um, the first one and the fourth one were on DeSoto. And kind of the right. second one too, eventually. But um yeah, there's a lot of label hopping. Um, we're on up owned and oper owned and operated was cool. <laughs> that was uh, the Descendants dudes, Black Flag dudes. So that was kind of big for me. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that must have been super cool. Did yeah. uh, did those guys ever take you out on tour? Or no, we never really. I don't think it would have really worked out very well musically. No, but um, you never. <laughs> not as uncomfortable as us and say Jets to Brazil. That was interesting. Why was it that? Was pretty, um, because we were definitely the obstacle before the band they wanted to see. <laughs> and we would just go out and be loud. And it's, I, I like all those dudes. I think they're great. And I like their records a lot. But and I, I think bands should be different. I don't want to see the same band every night. Definitely, definitely not. I mean, we try and do that at Vitus as much as possible. Like the the uh, what uh, that's really interesting to me that Jets of Brazil fans would have an issue unless it's just like the Blake Schwarzenbach worship situation that I mean it was definitely some of that but I think we were just like too much like I think we were too rock you know really wow I I, I would never imagine that I, I mean I know if I went to see Jets of Brazil and you guys opened I would have been like holy shit this is fucking incredible it, it's 
to me that fits what so was that the most uncomfortable tour you'd ever been on or was there no i mean like i said like everybody was cool and it wasn't really an issue it was just like kind of awkward every time we it was the same thing with death cab um we went out with them and played the egg the whole thing every night and uh there were a lot of like please be done faces <laughs> What era, what era so that was, was Death Cab really big at that time? or no, I think or, they had just done uh, the photo album that was for that record, which is like okay. kind of the start of their mega-ness. Right, right. I, I remember them playing it like brownies with like the promise ring and shit. It's uh, it, yeah. crazy. Like, uh, how I mean, they were, still, they were still in like a van and stuff. They weren't like a bus or anything. So. Right. That's cool. I mean, it, yeah, you guys, you guys toured quite a bit. Um, mm, tried our, to. And it, we played a bunch of times together at Brownies, and and uh, yeah, again, like it was always, which was funny because when you did the Gramercy Theater show, which was your first reunion show, that we at Aerotype opened, it was yeah. actually on the same date, uh, something like ten years previous that we had played together at Brownies. That's funny. And, uh, yeah, it was like it was it was weird. Like I, I, I don't know. I just felt like I had so, personally. I had a great connection with you guys, and it's like it was really nice when you came and played Vitus, and you know, Alan finally uh, played with Life and Times after asking him eight thousand fucking times to do it. <laughs> they were always they were always busy playing Knitting Factory or something. Um, yeah, yeah. But it, that Life and Times, if nobody's ever heard of Life and Times, go check that out because it's, uh, it's pretty much, it sounds a lot like Shiner, but without Josh. So <laughs> Yeah. It, it's just not, not, it not enough on, stupid noises. You played on a, a Life and Times record, didn't you? Um, there was a, well, initially when Life and Times began, some of those songs started, Shiner had played one or two of those songs out live, I think, on the first uh, Life and Times EP. And I wrote like a cello part this thing that ended up getting used on one of the records yeah i was wondering so um so why did shiner call it quits what was it by the end we hated each other <laughs> <laughs> i mean not really but we we were so tired of doing the whole like it seemed like we were gonna get signed so many times and uh yeah <laughs> you know th it would be like all this interest would pop up and they just go away. Like labels would come see us and be like, that was fucking awesome. I don't know how to sell it. Yeah. So, you know, um, and we, we went to the, we, the worst place I can think of was we would go play Bernie's Bagelry in Columbus to like six people. <laughs> and after, you know, five years of doing that, you're like, all right, what are we, what are we doing here? Yeah. And now there's four, four people instead of six people. I felt I felt like it was, that was a little bit of a, a bonding experience between at least our type of China because we had similarly been passed on by everybody mm -hmm. and like I don't I don't know what to do and for me personally I just once my guitar once Phil quit it was like okay we're gonna start we're gonna change our name we'll get a we'll get a record deal in six months with the same songs and I was totally right and yep. it's like fuck, you know it just shows like how stupid the music industry was. It still is kind of, um, but yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, it's it's it, it was it's all, it was, that back then it was rough. Once you got passed on, it was like nope, that's it, you're done. Like yeah, you were taint, you were definitely tainted. Yeah, and and Once you guys that happened. like like similarly with every type, like I just I felt like we were we just didn't have the sound for the indie emo scene. Like we just were too rock, mm -hmm. and I, similarly with you guys in a different way. And, yeah. and it, yeah, it's like, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow, especially at the time. It was just like, we're so good. What's wrong? You know, it's like, yeah, sorry, guys, you know, and you <laughs> songs and putting out records. And eventually you like, you get tired of writing songs and putting them out that, you know, aren't going to be listened to the proper way. So, it's, mm -hmm. you know, fuck it. I'm not going to waste my songs anymore in this way. But uh, I mean, but you, like, what's interesting about you guys is that in retrospect, especially with the egg, you guys actually got more popular after you broke up. Yep. So that must have felt good, right? And it's it, it was definitely like uh, a surprise and it felt awesome. And even with the release of this record, it feels like 
way bigger to me than when we did the egg. Well, yeah, because I mean, with the egg, it got a lot of critical review, but you guys still weren't playing to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Whereas yeah. now you can play to a lot more fucking people. And well, I, nobody can play to anybody right now, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it, look, you're, you're in a band full of fucking studio engineers. You guys should work out some sort of a fucking live show thing. We're talking about it. Um, this, we're, we're going to work on something. Yeah. Something's going to happen. So people can see us act, that we can actually play these songs at the same time. Yeah, I mean that, that would. I mean, I see everybody fucking do like Alex Skolnick and Charlie Benante doing Rush covers. I mean, come on. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> That's pretty great. It was fucking incredible. I, I interviewed Alex uh, two weeks ago, and and like I, I was, I, like, I forgot to ask him about it, but it was just like one of those things where it's like when you he, when he's playing Red Barchetta or Spirit of the Radio or something, he's not looking at the fretboard. He's looking at the fucking, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. And he's, you know, he's like played those songs a trillion times. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I was, I was worried about bringing up Rush and being like, if I bring up Rush, we're going to fall down a rabbit hole that for an, like in the whole interview is going to turn into Rush. Yeah. I'm really good at. <laughs> so uh, what, what are your guitar influences? Like what, what, I mean, I, what I personally hear is Radiohead. I mm. hear um, the, the obvious one, something like Jawbox or, or something to that effect. Like what, although you're more contemporary to Jawbox. So like, it's definitely not Ace Freely. That's not your fucking influence. So I, it. No, that's true. <laughs> um, I uh, mostly post punk stuff and kind of goth stuff, really. Um, like Daniel Ash from Bauhaus was a big one. Robert Smith was a big one. Um, Keith Levine, Public Image was a big one. Uh, the Six Finger Satellite guys, that was a huge, huge band for me because they were from Providence as well. So I saw like every incarnation of that band and how they went from being weird grunge band to being like the new Devo kind of sort of thing. Um, who else was big? Uh, I mean, Dwayne Dennison from The Jesus Lizard is a huge one for me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and John Reese and Rick Froberg from Jehu, that was a mega one. And then the guy from Chavez, too. Yeah, I mean, that, that all makes perfect sense. <laughs> I, stole, I stole pretty equally from all of them. So, uh. <laughs> uh, so what about, I mean, you're also a fucking incredible bass player. Um, I'm especially really, really, really love your tone, which is why we look to you when, when we needed a bass player to replace sure. Eric, <laughs> is another Midwesterner who worships jesus lizard yeah. um did uh like what what was your is it, is it similar bands that were your bass influences or do you have bass influences or you just, like picked it up you know you needed to? the biggest two were probably i mean dave sims is definitely a huge one but um i was really kind of inspired by uh carlos d from interpol actually sure. those i mean their songs have become radically different without his bass lines, I think, yeah. you know. He's, a, he's an incredible musician in general. Mm. Like, I think he's actually like a trained musician, like, you know, can write and read music and shit like that. Uh, that must be nice. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know, I took, I took classical guitar lessons and I totally faked how to, how to read music until my teacher threw me out of the room. But nice. uh, yeah, <laughs> it was classy, um, but it, prove that i have a photographic memory uh when i'm not drinking of course uh but yeah it's uh it, that's a good listen of course like that's probably all the same people not, i would say i would for me personally i would throw walter Schreifels in there just because of his like he's not technically the greatest bit guitar player ever but he you always know when he's playing on something he has this mm -hmm. tone and 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 um that's the uh, that's what always interests me, but like you, you, you were never into any sort of seventies progressive rock. I was... Um, King Crimson was always in there. Definitely. Okay. That, that was King Crimson got played a lot in the glazed baby van. Um, but that's kind of only where I heard it really. It wasn't, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Not, a, not a ton of that stuff until I got older. I didn't listen. I kind of refused to listen to classic rock for, 
and and prog rock anything basically like old i had no time for i know i know <laughs> <laughs> but when I, then when i was like over like i didn't even like zeppelin until i was like in my 30s and i was like oh okay i get it i wouldn't have <laughs> i wouldn't have soundgarden if i didn't have if you know if this didn't exist exactly yeah, it took, but it took a while no and that's fine i mean you know do you have older brothers or sisters or yeah sister well i have an older brother too but i the music thing was from my older sister and she got me into like the who and punk rock and stuff like that so i guess I, okay i take it back i liked the who okay fair enough that, that works turns out turns out their bass player and drummer are pretty good yeah they're, they're okay guitar player's yeah. not bad a great rhythm player not yep. the greatest player but a great rhythm player um, i mean look at a lot of pages solos not the best i yeah i mean they're not quite i mean like like live he, well yeah he played like he was wearing gloves half the time but, uh, <laughs> yeah but yeah it's a but i mean he's fucking jimmy page and yes he is you know like like when, the, the thing that i learned from led zeppelin was alternate tunings mm -hmm. uh, and roy harper via led zeppelin um that once once the alternate tunings thing gets introduced to you it's like the world i mean i remember learning about drop d from helmet mm -hmm. and it was like what i just have to lay my finger across the water? this is it yeah and it sounds so good it, but like once i got into real alternate alternate tunings with with the jimmy page thing that shit is like everything i play sounds like it's fucking genius like, yeah <laughs> It's fucking, it's so good. Do, do any, I saw, of the, I, any of the guys you work for playing alternate tunings or are they all like? Um, the weirdest one is probably Sleater Kinney who tuned a C sharp standard, which was a, a, yeah, such a surprise. Wow. And they use really thin strings too. So like part of their sound is sort of like the, the wavering between the notes a little bit. Huh. That's yeah. so interesting. Let's get into that a little bit. Um, uh, so being a tech is something obviously like I respect a tremendous amount because, you know, I, I well, first of all, I, I, I ran production at St. Vitus for a very long time and a lot, so many of my closest friends are techs. And, you know, I, I, you know, when I was on a major label, I had lots of techs and it was fun. And uh, even though I, refused to let my friends um, carry equipment in front of me. I would never, I always, I always had to carry equipment. It would be like, no, no, I'm sorry guys. Like, it's like, no, dude, we're working. This is our job. We get paid to do this. And I was like, yeah, yeah I nothing. I understand that. But like, still like, I, you know, it's just the punk rock. I can't do it. I can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, how did you fall into that line of work? A and B um, was Fall Out Boy the first band? that you worked with or no? I mean, when I was a kid, I used to help my friends' bands out. Um, but the, the band I actually worked for, yes, Fall Out Boy was the first one. Um, so not a bad beginning. No. <laughs> um, so they were just getting back together. I had already played with Joe in The Damn Things. And so Fall Out Boy decided to get back together shortly thereafter. And he was like, oh, I need a tech. And he was just like, why don't you just do it? You like guitars and you've been teching for yourself for 20 years. And uh, all right, cool. And it like became my career. So thanks to Joe, he basically gave me a career. I mean, it's, it's uh, that's fucking Joe's a great guy. It's fucking, mm. he, uh, he's a fucking wise ass. <laughs> <laughs> he's really I, funny. I can remember a few a few incidents at, at Vitus where he's, he's like, just like openly making fun of people. And I was like, oh, shit. He's going to start a fight. <laughs> Dude from Fallout Boy starts fighting, um, yeah. but yeah, I, like, like it, it's uh, what was the? I'm trying to think of like how much technical knowledge you have. Do you rebuild amps? Do you like are you, like? Um, I'm starting to get into the whole amp thing, just uh, dipping my toes in it. But I'm like terrified of getting electrocuted. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not a luthier by any means. Uh, I, I maintain the gear and basically just make sure it's set up correctly. Um, you know, I mean, I know my way around tones and 
gear and stuff like that. And I've just, I've always been obsessed with gear and guitars and pedals and amps. And I just, I love it. I just, <laughs> such a nerd. What's, uh, what's your favorite guitar? Um, the Travis Bean F Wedge is my favorite guitar. The ugliest guitar there ever was. Uh, what's your favorite bass? Uh, P bass. Just a standard P bass, American. Yep. Yep. What, what about amps? Uh, I'm a fan of the high watt DR103, I think it is. The 100 watt high watt or the 50. That's still stupid loud too. And for the bass, I like the Mesa Boogie 400 plus. That's my favorite bass amp. Nice. <laughs> it's pretty loud. <laughs> um, did you ever have trouble finding left-handed guitars? Did, like, I, I mean, uh, like people, I, I know I keep harping on it, but it's like, it really does make us sort of unique in a weird way um, because people don't really understand how difficult it was, especially. It's a little bit yeah. easier to think because of the internet, but yep. back in the day, you know, I, so I have a great story about my SG. My SG was, so I was like, I want a black SG. This is 1991. And I saved up all this money and I'm like, I'm going to fucking get a black SG. So I go to my local guitar store and they're like, well, of course we have, we're going to, we have to call Gibson. So they call Gibson and they're like, yeah, we got one. <laughs> Paul McCartney wow. ordered it a year ago and never picked it up. So you, do you want that one? And the guy's like, do you want Paul McCartney's guitar? I'm like, yeah, I want Paul McCartney's fucking guitar. No, no, I don't want that one. Okay. <laughs> well, what color is it? Which I <laughs> tour um but put back together many many times yeah uh, did you have trouble finding gear did you because you're a gearhead and it's like i couldn't imagine you at 17 walking into a fucking guitar shop in providence and just finding something to play um what did i do well i mean like i said at the time i was still playing a lot of upside down guitars and just taking out the control. Like, if I would buy, like, a Strat, I would just take the controls out, and just, it would be wired hard to the jack. Gotcha. Um, where did I get guitars? What was, I, your, I, there was, what was your first lefty, your first natural lefty? Shit. Maybe a Mustang. I think it, yeah. I think it was a Mustang. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, it, it yeah, makes and at the time, I was in, like, full Cobain mode, so it was totally <laughs> fine, you know. Was Nirvana a big thing for you? Yeah, Bleach was huge for me. I you think I saw him the day Nevermind came out. Oh wow! And the and the the day before actually too in Boston. Um, yeah, it was pretty awesome. In Providence, Kurt's amp blew up, and they just he sat there sulking for a while, and they played Endless Nameless, and he like smashed everything and did a stage dive and. <laughs> It's pretty typical Nirvana, but kind of awesome to see. Yeah, that's fucking, that's insane. Yeah, yeah I think they played, uh, I think they, they played CBs before they played up in Boston during that time. So they, one of the guys from Bad Trip had gone to see them and they, there was like 30 people at CBs. And they like, you know, and then like two weeks later, I was like, and it was like, oh. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that was a really special, special time. Like, I, um, and it was a, such a great time to be into music, you know? It's like, it was like all the classic rock that you didn't listen to in the 70s was influencing uh, <laughs> um, all the music in the, in the, in the 90s. Was like, what, what was, uh, like, were you into Pearl Jam and Smashing Pumpkins? And yeah, actually, we, um, we played with Pearl Jam and Glaze Baby on their first tour. We played Providence together. Oh, wow. And we were excited because it was the guys from Temple, the dog. Because I had already had that record, and I was like, cool. You know, anything with, like, grunge related at the time, I was, I was pretty psyched about. Um, and Eddie Vedder was, like, the nicest dude in the world. And a lot of people left after we played, actually, before Pearl Jam came out. He is really nice. Yeah. That's, um, so speaking of that, as a guy who's been around a lot of celebrities, I'm sure, a lot of famous musicians, um, I'm gonna, I won't ask any negative questions yet because I want to. Yeah. But, uh, like, who's, is there anybody that stands out in your brain that, like, it was really, 
great to their crew or just a great person or a total dick to their crew. Because I hear the dick stories all the time. Yeah. No, you know, those are legendary shit. Um, Fall Out Boy has always been really nice and taking care of their crew. Uh, Kings of Leon have gone above and beyond taking care of Got the it. crew. And this, but in this time, they've, uh, they, they've, they did us right. Because I'm supposed to be on tour, like, from February until, you know, two days ago. Wow. Um, uh, Slater Kinney, uh, I work for Carrie and Slater Kinney, and she is super awesome. And, and Katie Harkin, the two people that I work for, they've been super great. Um, I'm kind of hesitant to say the bad thing, because everyone loves this person, and I will crush <laughs> so many hearts. Uh, Come on, Josh. We tell, tell the story and not tell the person's name. Okay, I won't say the person's name. Okay. Um, we were playing a show in Milwaukee, and this person had come from trying. You, ever, you played the rave, I'm sure, in Milwaukee. Yeah. All three. <laughs> yeah. So the showers in the rave are down. Are they're, they're way downstairs now. They're not even like in Steven Tyler's looking area anymore. Like now they're downstairs in the basement, basement by the pool. So to use that shower, it pool takes... After. Let's talk about the pool after the story, by the way. The pool is terrifying. <laughs> uh, so I think this person was tired of waiting for the shower or took a cold shower and then came up to do sound check. And we were starting sound check and they asked me uh, if they had to come up and reset their pedals every time or if that was part of my job to set their stuff up right. And then took me aside after screaming full on at the bass player, like a scream, took me aside and asked me and told me that they just didn't have faith in my ability to tune their guitars anymore. But not only did they take and say this to me, this person grabbed me by the wrists, like, and like, come here, come talk to me. So as they said that, I was like, um, I'm sorry to have disappointed you. That was all I could think of to say. I mean, I was furious and I felt nauseous and I called my girlfriend like, I think I'm gonna fucking quit. Like, I think I'm coming home tomorrow. Did you? No, I didn't. I actually worked for them for a while longer and went to, uh, <laughs> I went to Europe with them. And then I had to come back for a Kings of Leon show and then go back to Europe. And I went back to Europe and quit <laughs> like three <laughs> days in, but I found somebody else, but, uh, I mean, was it, was it a, did, they, did it get better after that day or? It was kind of ignored, like it never happened. Right. And for me, every show was like starting, every show was like the first show of the tour, every single day. Every sound check was like the first sound check. So it was, it was crazy. The whole thing was fucking crazy. I got, I, I mean, you can tell me afterwards who it was, but. I, it, okay. It, that's uh yeah so let's talk about the rave for a sec so yes um so the rave is this really famous uh place in milwaukee wisconsin that has three stages a small basement um middle size in the middle and then a really big guy at the top yeah called the rave ballroom and it was a ballroom from like in the 1920s and 30s and it had this public pool in the basement and the pool uh eventually uh, got closed down because a bunch of people had drowned in it and it's been closed for like 40 50 years so every time the bands play the dressing rooms are right next to the pool yeah and if you're lucky you can get a there's a weird stairwell remember the stairwell did you ever get the tour of that yeah yeah that's really cold yeah like, and and there's a boiler room in the basement which is like total blair witch project which i think is what i heard they based it on um <laughs> I played so many times at the rave before I got into that fucking pool. And I had to, I had to do the opening for corn. And John Davis requested the dressing room that was attached to the back, to the pool as his, as his dressing room, you know, yeah. in a mob sort of way. So we had to go through John's dressing room because, of course, he was on his bus. He wasn't even in the fucking dressing room. And we went in, and that was like, that was the first time I got in there. And I remember like, I remember all the bands had autographed Wall, who had gotten in there. So it was like fucking Newfound Glory and like whatever. And uh, 
Is it head creaky? PE. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, like, there's a creepy chair in the corner that just faced the wall. Like it, that. There was the the weird like fucking jacuzzi room that had like weird fog written in the dirt. I mean, it was a freak show. Do you have any fun memories of the rave like that? I, when you combine that place with the fact that the hotel across the street, Dahmer. Jeff Dahmer killed somebody at the hotel across the street. Well, he picked up, there was a gay night yeah. in the basement and he picked up, I think it was one of his first victims and killed him in the hotel across the street. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> After my showdown with my former employer, I immediately went over to that bar at that hotel and had a couple drinks before the show. Did you really? <laughs> yeah, I was fucking pissed. Anyway, that, Milwaukee. Probably, the only reason anybody goes in that place is because because of that, just like yeah. um, fucked up reasons. But that, I guess they they took the wall where he killed the person, and they just there's no door there anymore. They just went right over it with sheetrock. No way, really? Yeah. Shit, I, crazy um speaking of venues like what uh what are some of your favorites i mean you've done so many places uh like i know i have particular favorites like brooklyn steel and brooklyn is just a fucking incredible place or brixton academy um but i always you know like just playing those places and the crew and the atmosphere mm -hmm. are there is there places that you can like pinpoint like love to play, doing shows at i mean i'm your, your venue, I always enjoyed very much. Um, let's see, I liked, uh, I liked the Space Line was cool. I always had a good time there. The place yeah. was always fun. As, as stressful as playing LA was. Um, <laughs> uh, Casbah, even though nobody goes to see us in San Diego, it's pretty, besides, oh. besides Adam, Adam always comes to see I us. But, Adam. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, empty Bottle is always fun. I like the Double Door a lot, that place. Legendary places, say like that Fall Out Boy played or, you know, like, like uh, or, they, or Kings of Leon or like, you know, like, like a Brixton Academy type style place, like uh, Rock City in Nottingham or shit like that. Actually, uh, that, that place was always awesome. For From Autumn to Ashes and, and every time I died, that place was like insane every time we played there. Um, I just did Brixton with Slater Kinney. That was the last show I've worked this year, actually, was at Brixton. What venue? Uh, it was oh, Brixton. Brixton, yeah. Yeah. I thought, I, for some reason, I had Brighton in my head, and I was like, oh, Brighton, where are they playing Brighton? Where, where could Slater Kenny play in Brighton? I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know any of the big venues over there. Um, but yeah, Brixton, Brixton is one of those. I have a funny story about Brixton where um, uh, we opened for Stain, and, and uh, I was trying to you know so you know like how you can walk from the dressing rooms to the vip bar yeah and the the aaron lewis is the singer of stain's bodyguard was standing out front and he wouldn't let me walk the three feet to the door to get to the vip so i had to go all the way down all the way around yeah and I was like uh it's like dude like i just played i just opened what do you think i'm gonna run in and shoot this fucking jerk off like i wish <laughs> smack him but like yeah like <laughs> kind of needs to keep his fucking mouth but, um <sighs> yeah man fucking so let's uh let's talk about the new china record um how did you guys record it did you get all together did you like do it remotely how did um, work? everything was recorded together except for uh swallow the second to last song that was a late addition and alan sent <laughs> so it started with we alan and i started going through old songs um even some from like starless demos that hadn't hadn't really come to fruition or had been cannibalized and become other songs we started going back and forth with that and none of it really some of it was pretty good but none of it actually felt current or felt like what we would be doing now and so the first one that he sent me was um, Paul P. Poe. And that was just like, okay, I know what we're gonna do. And then I wrote uh, in the end, the first song. And then we were just like fucking off to the races that kind of opened up the, the gates for the writing stuff. And then when we recorded it, everything was recorded together except for that Swallow song. Um, Alan sent us a demo with like change here 
here it comes one two three <laughs> like so i'm listening to that at the same time as jason's tracking drums and we're just like dying laughing <laughs> um, that was the only one we never actually played together okay um yeah i, I mean i i, I think I, I texted you or or posted a comment about the third song on the record which i can't remember the name of i'm terrible with notes but that song to me i know you were channeling you too yes but to me that sounds like an 80s rush song i mean straight up it's like like i and in fact it like it reminded me so much of it that i couldn't get it out of my fucking head i was just like I was like, Hold your fire. Or it's like i forget what fucking song it was fuck but it was driving me fucking nuts but like every time i listen to it i'm just like dee, dee, dee. like that, that tone is just perfect it's yeah. perfect like so what were you like seriously trying to channel the edge was that like you were just like fuck the edge man <laughs> Well, I didn't have a part. I was the last one to have a part for that song. I knew what we were going to do like, during the Hendrixy part or the cream part, you know, the chorus part, whatever that is. Um, but for the verses, man, I had nothing. And I was just like, maybe this song sucks. Maybe I don't. I was like on the borderline of maybe like trying to veto it because I just couldn't think of anything. And suddenly at the last minute, I was like, oh. I like hit the right pedal and all of a sudden everything made sense. And I was like, oh, <laughs> cool. Wait, and now it sounds like The Edge. All right, let's just go with it. All of a sudden you were The Edge in uh, the movie Play It Loud. When he, Pretty much, yes. In the scene where he's like playing with all his delay pedals. He's like, yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> and everyone's like, he sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I saw you and I'll tell you right now, that motherfucker stole the show. He was like, he was incredible. Fuck. Yeah. Like, are you a big U2 fan at all? Or I am until uh, Rattle and Hum. Okay, yeah, I mean, I'm the I think, I think that's where I get out. But Unforgettable Fire for me is, like, mind-blowing. It's so funny. Like, we must be the same age. That's my favorite, too. And, like, like the, the, the guitar work, just everything as a band on that record, they were just on fire. Mm -hmm. that but, like, the, the uh, um, it's, it's super interesting to me. Like, I, I just find him to be... I find him to be really angular and interesting. Mm -hmm. and, it, and obviously it plays into your sort of post-punk love of guitar players, you know, Daniel Ash and whatnot. Uh, who's the guitar player from Echo and the Bunnymen is very similar mm -hmm. to, to Edge. Um, but I think uh, U2 was just way more ambitious than everybody else. So they were just like... Yeah, no. I mean, they started off pretty Joy Division kind of when they started, I yeah. think, sound-wise. And then once you mix Brian Eno in there, Forget about it. And Lenoir, too. I mean, Lenoir yeah, was, totally. was doing all sorts of different interesting sounds for those guys. I mean, it's uh, like them and Metallica are like the two bands that like just you could almost feel their ambition. They were like, mm -hmm. we're going to be the biggest band in the fucking world. And, you know, they were. And, and, but like, <laughs> Ed, like, he's just a, like one of the most special players to ever exist. I mean, guys, you know, like, I love Ingve Malmsteen. I love, I love Shred. I love, I love your playing. Like, I mean, I was a, I was like, for me, when I was like 12, 13, 14, Steve Vai was like my dude. Really? Yes. Okay. I wanted to, I wanted to be Steve Vai so bad. Like I would have killed someone for a lefty pink or green or yellow Ibanez gem. Oh, the when gem I was seven? Oh. I actually had an RBG 550. Which really? was uh, the Steve Vai guitar lefty with yep. the handle. Because the handle yep. was too expensive. Yeah, it costs a lot more for less of a guitar. Exactly. You, you cut that handle in, you know, so mm. you can... And but you also need... You board. needed pink pickups, though, too. What's that? You need to have pink pickups and pink oh. knobs and all that stuff, too. Pink pickups. <laughs> pointless. Yeah. Not a, it's so fun. Uh, so I, I wanted to... Uh, we got eight minutes. I, I wanted to tell a great Jason Gherkin story. That okay. Hit, you know, and for anybody who doesn't know what, what I'm talking about, Jason Gherkin is the drummer of Shiner. He played, plays in Hum on occasion, um, uh, Molly McGuire. Uh, yep. fuck, we talked about it earlier. This guy is just fucking magic when he's behind the drums. It's just incredible. But he's the most interesting, crazy person alive. And it's, I, it's funny because I've listened to a bunch of um, podcast with him recently and like and I, oh it's dude I like to party yeah <laughs> so 
Jason Gherkin, to me, should have been Neil fucking Peart, as far as I was concerned. But wow. he, he likes to party. Yeah. And so I was on tour with Instruction. We played the Casbah with Helmet. And this guy walks up to the, to the merch table and he goes, hey, man, I know you from somewhere. And I'm like, yeah. What, what? He's like, I was like, were you in bands or something? He's like, yeah, man. Uh, I was like, well, what bands? He's like, I was in China. I was like, Jason Gherkin? What the fuck? I didn't even recognize him. <laughs> and this was 2003. Our drummer, this was our drummer's last show. Second to last show. He had just quit. And mm -hmm. we're supposed to continue with Helmet and then go on tour with Korn in arenas for like three months. And Gherkin, <laughs> he's like, he's like, I was like, do you, do you want to play drums for us? We'll pay you. Like, we're on Geffen. And he's like, yeah, man. Said, give me a copy of the record. So I give him a copy of the record. And he's like, he's like, I was like, do you have a phone number? He's like, well, I don't have a cell phone right now. But, but like, <laughs> so he writes down this fucking phone number, right? And, and he's like, he like, writes it down and he's just like, I'm like, all right, cool. I'll call you tomorrow. Like, all right, great, man. Terrific. Yeah, this is going to be fucking great. I call the number the next day and this girl answers. And she's just like, I'm like, yo, uh, uh, is Jason there? She's like, no. He didn't come home last night, and uh, yeah, I doubt this is not. He'll never be allowed in here again. Uh, <laughs> and I was just like, uh, uh, so I like hung up, and I was like, uh, I don't know how to get in touch with this guy. And like, yeah. I, I thought we were set. I thought we, I thought we were so fucking. Set. I was like, we're gonna get fucking Gherkin to play drums for us. We're, I, he doesn't have a job right now. I'm gonna fucking give him a job. It's gonna be awesome total fuck up like it wow. was it was so funny and like i guess he was sleeping on this girl's couch or something or like whatever and like just it just all went south really fucking quickly <laughs> that seems to be how it goes with jason yeah fucking <laughs> <laughs> loves the party yes. it's a fucking classic oh, you know, uh, well, oddly enough later on he and i at different times both tried out for helmet and didn't get it oh shit no way yep you got rejected from Helmet? Yeah, I was going to, I was supposed to, I went and tried out, I had like Helmet Fantasy Camp. I went and did a bass audition and that was, I played the worst I've ever played in my fucking life, actually. I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually pretty, I'm, I know the bass player for Helmet now, this guy Dave mm -hmm. Case, pretty well. He's from Long Island. And uh, I know the drummer too, uh, Kyle. It, he was mm -hmm. in the collapse. But yeah, it's fucking, that's so funny. They're actually really good now. Yeah. I've known the guitar player uh, forever. Stan, you've been on here before. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he was watching. <laughs> um, Weird. So uh, tell people where they can get your record. Um, uh, tell I'll tell them where they can come see us live. Oh, no, I won't. No, that's not going <laughs> to um, It's Shiner.net. Oh, it's on all the streaming services and all of the, uh, all the internet places where you get records nowadays. And I suggest everybody pick up this record. To me, it's the record of the year, hands down. Um, the song Mannequin, which was the first single, is just like eternally stuck in my head at three o'clock in the morning. And I want to punch Alan and be like, fuck you, dude. Yeah. Oh, I forgot. Kevin Shields. That's also kind of a major one for me, too. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean. And the Swerve Driver guys. We just missed an hour of not talking about Shugit. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> Blew it. I want. I wanted to sneak it in there at the end. Yeah. Oh, fuck, man. You fucked me now. Like, yeah. Sorry. That's all I want to do is talk about shoegaze all the time. I'm sure it is. Well, you we can talk about. We we can talk about Oasis. Oh, please. Don't get started. <laughs> like, I, I, you know, Alan has. A, you know, Alan has an Oasis cover band. Yes, I've seen footage of it. It's incredible. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's super fun. I've I've I've, I've always wanted to start. I almost did start a Oasis B-side cover band, only B-sides, acoustic, called yep. Let's Believe, and it was gonna be awesome, but like, I hate playing cover songs. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And I, it's all make-believe, you know, that's- man. That's pretty good. I, I can do it, man, I can do it. I, the one thing I can do is I can sing. I suck at guitar, but I can sing. <laughs> um, so yeah, man, everybody go out and check out the Shiner record uh, and, uh, Everything else that um, that Josh has done over the years, which is fucking incredible, uh, Glaze Baby and Season Risk and From Autumn to Ashes 
and uh, for Every Time I Die. Did you play it on Every Time I Die record? Yeah, I was on a couple of them. Okay. And <laughs> fucking The Damn Things and uh, With Knives and yeah. uh, it's all fantastic. And I love you, dude. Fucking awesome. I love you. Thank you for having me. Fucking, we're going to get through it. And uh, tune in uh, tomorrow, H. Carl at 8. And thanks, Josh. Thank you. Later, brother. See you, man.